Today I thought like we'd talk about a topic that's a bit different from what I would usually cover. Like I want to talk about uh, a lot of more recent work around bias in machine learning. So the reason I find this topic interesting is because like for the longest time it was sort of, uh, I guess, really dismissed in the machine learning community. But at this point, people are trying to find uh, solutions to it. And, and I'll... And while the solutions are actually hard to somewhat agree with, like we can sit and debate as to like, is this a good solution? Is this the best solution? I think all of the above is really unclear uh, because there's lots of competing proposals given that it's like sort of, sort of a burgeoning field. On the other hand, I think everyone can sort of agree somewhat to what the problems are. Uh, and so this, so this session will, will somewhat cover both spectrums, like the problems and then the solutions to it, just because if I say bias in ML, that problem definition isn't entirely clear. Uh, so the, I thought the way I would do this, like I, I downloaded all these references before, before the session, uh, and they all looked somewhat good to me, just like after a very cursory overview. So I thought like, let's just go over like a couple of them, uh, see how they work, see if they make sense. And obviously as always, if you have any questions in chat about anything I cover, uh, that's totally cool. Just feel free to interrupt me. All right, let's start off a bit easy. So let's do, for example, a heading around uh, bias in healthcare and then start to summarize some of this stuff. All right. So it's a three-part block series on healthcare, and we'll discuss the benefits, the risks of using AI, uh, and the impact of human bias on AI data and algorithms. Okay, I mean, I'm not too optimistic based on the setting, but let's keep going. Well, data reflects historical and contemporary and cognitive social biases, could unwittingly perpetuate or even amplify bias in healthcare delivery. Um, sure, yeah. So, so basically, if you are, you, like, I mean, let's see. So the growing use of AI across many industries has sparked many recent debates uh, around AI and fairness. And as AI-powered tools gain momentum, stakeholders have a critical window of opportunity to develop a process for addressing biases. And so while there are many real-world potential benefits from using AI, bias occurs when we discriminate against a particular group, either consciously through explicit preconceived ideas such as racism or sexism, and unconsciously through ingrained thoughts based on assumptions or stereotypes, or inadvertently through the, through the use of data skewed towards a particular segment of the populations. So patients of color are less likely to receive pain management. Okay. So the stigma and bias can sometimes impact the treatment of obese patients. Clinical of a, maybe overlooked when healthcare providers oversimplify and assume that these patients cannot conform to lifestyle changes, such as modifying their diet, uh, attribute other health issues to obesity instead of investigating other potential causes. Oh, interesting, okay. So there's sort of two ideas here. So one is uh, treatment. Uh, so they're sort of uh, explicit. Uh, yeah, I think the interesting ones are treatment may differ uh, based on race. For example, people of color are less likely to receive uh, pain medication. Uh, doctors are less likely uh, to uh, do uh, due diligence on a diagnosis if the patient is obese. So then the intent of AI is to help healthcare providers make more uh, objective decisions. So if you want to teach a machine to estimate a factor such as disease prevalence across various demographics, you feed it in millions of data records and tell how to identify the target groups and contributing factors. So then it makes, for example, if the data used for an AI technology is gathered only from academic medical centers, then the resulting AI will learn less about patient populations that do not typically seek care at academic medical centers. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so this is sort of a... So, so basically, this is also true uh, for psychology experiments. Like most psychology experiments are done on psychology undergrads. As a result, the data directly skews towards the belief of young undergraduates that happen to be in psychology programs. So uh, academic data tends to be uh, biased towards uh, students that 
are in academic institutions and are not uh, like representative of the wider population. So bias built into AI has societal, legal, and monetary implications. Take the recent case of United Health Group's Optum division. Uh, the organization was unaware of the biases in the data used to develop a product marketed and sold to hospital systems to identify vulnerable people required care management. So it used past spending data to predict severity of illness without considering broader societal factors that result in racial inequalities and the amount of care received. Since less money was spent historically on black patients with the same level of need as their white counterparts, the algorithm falsely assigned black patients to the same level of risk as healthier white patients. So a study of this particular, bi okay, so yeah, this is interesting. So even though uh, some features are not explicitly uh, racist, uh, they, they could be basically indirectly racist by normalizing across features like income. For example, uh, less, the less uh, money spent on your healthcare solution, the less likely you are to uh, survive. So this is an interesting uh, function though, because I'm surprised that this, this was so one directional because I would also imagine that if you're in a condition that's very critical, like let's say you have heart disease or something, then the more money is spent on you, regardless of your race, the less likely, the less likely you are to survive, even though it's more money being spent. And that's just a function that your disease is more serious and that's why more money is being spent. Uh, but I guess I, I would just have to read the original paper to, to figure this out. Yeah, so basically regulators, yeah, so this is, this is sort of the interesting point. Like regulators are asking, uh, are asking healthcare providers for proof that their algorithms are not discriminatory or not use them. And so this is sort of where the discriminatory. Okay, I hope I spelled this right. Um, but basically, this is this is where the machine learning part comes in, and like, and it'll be a good segue into the other parts of this, uh, into the other parts of this discussion. Um, basically, like, how do you how do you prove this? Like, I mean, it, it, like, because there's sort of several ways to think about it. Like, I think one one straightforward way is to say, uh, okay, well. Uh, so there's many uh, competing uh, hypotheses uh, for how to solve this, but at a high level, uh, you can do what's called like uh, counterfactual uh, analysis. So what's the main idea behind this? So let's say, uh, so train uh, an algorithm on a data set uh, with income and train an algorithm on data set without income and then look at the diff and see if the racist predictions uh, go away so so i think this is sort of a very straightforward uh, way like it does require you to actually look at the data unfortunately which you know even though like let's say you want to reduce bias but then by looking at the data you're gonna uh, decrease privacy so I think like this sort of de depends on the on the use case that, like like you have to decide, uh, I guess like where where to, where to work along this spectrum. So you must work collaboratively between data scientists, healthcare providers, consumers, and regulators. So this is sort of I guess the problem definition, right? I'm just gonna do this.
and okay sure so so i guess now we're gonna sp like the, the problem here is interesting so it does seem like there's a couple of stuff like you want to make sure like in, in the case of healthcare uh, you want to make sure that people get the best treatment uh, regardless of uh, their race, uh, gender, religious beliefs, uh, etc. So how, how do you make this happen? So I thought here, like, let's maybe switch uh, gears just a little bit. But I thought we could talk about like bias and language models. So why are we talking about this? Like typically, uh, I, I don't remember which paper showed this, but basically, uh, if you basically take the the diff so let's say d is some uh, distance function in embedding space and so if you take the distance between uh let's say a uh, woman and nurse this is less uh, than the distance between uh, man and nurse so this is sort of like a like like one form of well, like one form of bias like in the embedding space uh, obviously it's not really uh, like when we say man and or, or nurse, like, sorry. Yeah, when we say uh, man or nurse, uh, sorry, man, woman or nurse are all uh, in embedding space. Uh, so how do we how do we solve this? So I found this paper by Sam Bowman that claims to solve this. So let's just take a quick look at it and we can get some sense of whether it works or not. Wait, this was not the paper though. This was one of them, but this was the one I was thinking about. Okay, so we have two papers we can take a look at. So let's say we have this one. And then we have this one. So let's see. So zooming in. Is this clear? <clears throat> so many text corpora exhibit socially problematic biases, which can be propagated or amplified in the model strain on such data. So for example, Dr. Coker is more frequently with male pronouns than female pronouns. Um, so in this work, they propose a metric to measure gender bias, measure bias in a text corpus and text generated from a recurrent neural network language model trained on the text corpus and propose a regularization loss for the language model that minimize the projection of encoder trained embeddings onto an embedding subspace that encodes gender. So finally, we evaluate the efficacy of our proposed method on reducing gender bias. We find this regularization method to be effective in reducing gender bias up to an optimal weight assigned to the loss term, beyond which the model becomes unstable as the perplexity uh, increases. And we replicate the study on three training corpora, Penn Tree Bank, Wikitext, and CNN Daily Mail, uh, resulting in similar conclusions. Okay, so like, let's see. So this work seems to be doing a couple of things. So propose uh, a metric to measure bias and propose a regularization strategy to uh, reduce bias. So let's take a closer look and see uh, how this actually works. So dealing with discriminatory bias in training data is a major issue concerning the mainstream implementation of machine learning. So existing biases can be amplified by models. Uh, and of course, like, and, and if you're, yo, hey, Mazen, it's a really long time. Glad, glad to be back, though, and uh, really nice to see you in chat. So just to give you some context, like, so today I'm covering a, a literature review on the on bias in machine learning so there's there's not going to be much programming i think for this session it's mostly just understanding the problem definition uh and like what people mean because like this is like actually a topic that i've uh, sort of glanced over many times over the years but one that i never went in very deep and try to understand like okay well what's the state of the art in people's understanding so my sleep schedule has been really bad the past two weeks i've been sleeping most of the day yeah, it's okay. I've definitely had that to me happen in grad school. Like, I definitely was an adult. I think it's just like, enjoy it while you're young. You won't be able to do this. Well, like once you're married or whatever. 
So models automating res resume screening have also proved to be heavy gender bias favoring male candidates. So such data algorithmic bias has become a growing concern. Evaluation and mitigation of biases in data models that use the data has been a growing field of research in recent years. Uh, oh, interesting. So, yeah, so let's see. So this is sort of tangential, but no, no, you don't have to apologize. Like, I, of course, understand if you're busy. Like, I'm, like, I'm going to do these anyway, so, but it's still, like, I mean, always, a, you know, it's more fun when you're around, so it's always a pleasure. I think in all cases, like, last week or so, like, last two weeks, I've been doing a lot more videos than streams. It's definitely a lot more time-consuming, but I don't know if you got the chance to check out some of the satire content I did. Uh, it's been, like, a nice change of pace from, like, the more serious streams. Same for the game hacking stream, so. Okay, so basically, so some forms of, uh, some notable forms of bias. So we have uh, male candidates uh, are preferred uh, in resume screens. Uh, face detection algorithms work better on the white males. What else? Towards the person we aim to evaluate the effect of gender bias. So our contribution to this work includes an analysis of the gender bias. Okay, great, great, great. So let's see, they're quoting some related work. So this will be a good segue. You have your uh, YouTube. Oh yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, yeah, it's been very different. Like, cause I, I used to do uh, I don't know, because like sometimes it's like I actually had the content for the YouTube channel as an essay for close to eight months now, but I never got around to writing it. Like it wasn't as funny. And so when I put it in video, uh, I think inspired by some of the, the, the meme channels. So you're not going to lie. I really like your sense of humor, but some of my friends don't get it, which made lost them. No, it's OK. I mean, like it, it's not going to be for everyone. I think like part of what makes the videos fun is that you do need some, I guess, background in ML. Otherwise, it's like completely lost. But yeah, regardless, I think like uh, I think my sense of humor is like fairly dry, so I don't know. It's probably not for everyone, but I enjoy it. I mostly just do what I think is funny. I don't tend to think of what other people may think is funny. So studies the neutral point of view, edit tags, and edit history. Uh, according to their study, bias can be broadly categorized into two classes: framing and epistemological. While the framing bias uh, is more explicit, the epistemological bias is implicit and subtle. So framing bias occurs when subjective or one-sided words are used. For example, in the sentence, usually uh, smaller cottage-style houses have been devolved to make way for these McMansions. The word McMansion has a negative connotation towards large and pretentious houses. Uh, epistemological biases are entailed as asserted or hedged in the text. For example, in the sentence, Cuppers claim that the mainstream press in America tends to favor liber liberal viewpoints. There is claimed as a doubtful effect on Cooper's statement. It may be possible to capture both of these kinds of biases to this future. Okay. Oh, interesting, interesting. I see. So in, uh, in language, uh, a sentence uh, can be uh, biased uh, in two ways. So there is uh, framing bias and epistemological, epistemological bias. So basically, uh, framing bias is basically this is bad, or this would be people, uh, you know, claim this is good. Interesting, yeah. So so both of them are just like a way of, I guess, like describing a group. So so both uh, are about uh, describing uh, something or a group of people uh, negatively but one is more subtle i think okay so word level language model is a three-layer lstm and lambda controls the importance of minimizing bias in the embedding matrix so we have a training corpus we have the bias in the training corpus we take the cross entropy loss plus lambda of the bias bias in generated text bias after realization Okay, this doesn't explain all that much. Like, I, I don't know what, what they mean by any of this. So I need to read the rest of this. But anyway, so Bulukapsi proposed an approach to investigate gender bias present in popular word embeddings, such as word to 
So they construct a gender subspace using a set of binary gender pairs. For words that are not explicitly gendered, the component of the word embeddings that project onto the subspace can be removed to debiased embeddings in the gender direction. So they also pro propose a softer variation that balances reconstruction of the original embeddings while minimizing the part of embeddings that project onto the gender subspace. I don't know what a gender subspace means, but let's see. The component of the word embeddings that project can be removed. I don't know if you have time to watch the video that I've shared with you on Twitter, but I became really interested in using deep learning for character movements in video games. Um, I think that's a great goal. Like, the, like I did check out the video. It's it's very pretty. I think that's what's cool about those uh, videos. I've seen a, a couple of those over the years. Uh, but I guess it's also why, like, I think if you're interested in this stuff, that's that's where the sort of intersection with Unity or Unreal or Godot with machine learning comes in. Uh, so I think it's awesome. I think you'll, it, it's, it's not like an area where I think you'll, uh, like, I wouldn't even call it like a hard research area. I think this is very applied. Like, if you, can, if you know how to make games, you can make animations, you can make movies, you can make games. Uh, Similar, if you like, because the core machine learning skill set of, uh, you know, I'm gonna run something with Keras. Like, I think that skill set is somewhat saturated at this point. Okay, so I guess like like now that I think about it, like fast approaches, for example, could uh, randomly uh, change uh, gendered. Uh, pronouns and data set or make genders balanced but this is not like a so this so but this would work for example uh, for stuff like the doctor uh, or nurse distance problem But it may not work like in some other areas. Like let's say you want to say like, oh, like a dad. Well, a, a dad is something that's generally specific to men. So like you're going to end up with some problems with your predictions or get some uh, issues with with the way like, like just either if you're generating something or classifying something, it may not make a lot of sense for a lot of people. They observe gender bias in the training examples and then that model there amplifies their bias in its predictions. Okay, so basically, okay, so I'm gonna call this change the data set, uh, regularize the model. I think those are the sort of the two core approaches. Oh, interesting. So, when are gender schemas and evaluate? Okay, so, so I, I will say like, let's say so co-reference. So, what co-reference resolution means is that if you have a he or she, <coughs> or they or anything, any sort of any sort of pronoun in a data set, and you want to refer it back to the original subject, like a person or a person's name, it's gonna prefer certain uh, professions depending on the type of. So I'm assuming, like, let's say he would prefer a doctor over she. Uh, so co-reference resolution uh, favors uh, male pronouns. Debiased pre-trained embeddings. Okay. Yeah, so regularize the model. And I would I will say like even though this is close to uh, regularize the model to remove bias. And I would say the third is uh, change uh, embeddings uh, to remove bias. So this is close to change the data set. Uh, 
but because like you have to train the embedding on some data sets so it's not like this magically gets solved so there, there is similar like it's, it's like similar to one so may i'll extend wheat to state-of-the-art sentence decoders okay using the biasing techniques proposed they show that bias removal techniques based on the gender are inefficient in removing all aspects of bias so in a high dimensional space uh, gender neutral word embedding almost same after debiasing this enables a gender neutral classifier to still pick up the cues that encode other semantic aspects of bias maybe we should just read this paper let's see so let's see so we first examine the bias existing in the data sets through qualitative and quantitative analysis of trained embeddings when we then apply a regularization procedure that encourages embeddings learned by the model to depend minimally on gender okay i'm curious how they do this uh, so we observe that both when input and output embeddings are debiased together, the perplexity of the model shoots up by much larger than the input or the output embeddings debiased de de individually. So generally you want perplexity to be low. What that means is you don't want the model to be very surprised. So the code implementing our methods can be found in our GitHub repository. Oh, cool. Let's check this out. Cambodia. Set the value of factor input the gender pair file. Husbands, wives, kings, queens. Okay, so they took like a bunch of common uh, like gender specific uh, words. Okay. Ten gender pairs. Okay. Free process. Okay, so this is the tokenization. Okay, they encode the sentence and they read it from the file, put it in the string. All right, they save the work of free process data set. Okay, none of this is important. So where is the actual code? Bias square is cute, this is. That co occurrences. I mean, yeah, it, it is definitely a small sample, but like, I guess it's one of those things where like they're they're looking at some sort of simplified version of the problem, and if it works, then they would scale it out. But let's see here. Like they have a list of files, so I guess here like they can count like occurrences of professions. Like let's say, do they have a professions dictionary? So how are they measuring the bias scores? Let's see. Tot. Okay, how did they get tot? score? How, how did they get score? So it's data words that are male divided. Oh, I see. Um, yes, actually, like this, this was the context in which I started looking into this because we were kind of thinking at work, like, how do we somewhat remove these bias uh, issues that GPT-3 has? And so that's kind of what got me to think like, okay, well, you know, let me just take a look. Like, is this a solved problem or is it sort of people are aware of the problem but don't know how to solve it? Because at this point, I'm still not sure. Uh, but kind of looking over this, it basically counts the number of male words and it divides it by the total number of words specific to men and specific to uh, females. And then it gets a gender ratio. So what does this return? Jason dump bias record bias record it's bias record so it's a dictionary of json of the words okay yeah i wish this had a readme this is kind of hard to read i'll save it like let's just go over the paper and i can get back to this all right 
So they use, okay, so these, all of these data sets that they're using are fairly standard. Maybe actually, if I do this, I can say uh, code here. Is imbalanced data to a specific uh, gender. Um, well, actually, like, that was, like, so while your opinion does sound reasonable, like, it's actually uh, was pretty rejected by people that are in this area. Like, you may want to see, like, the big feud between Timnit Gebru and Jan LeCun about this topic. But my understanding, uh, and again, like, I I'm not going to comment too much here because I need to read the paper, more, like, their argument more deeply, uh, was that they were arguing that it's not, like, bias isn't just this. Like, that there's many other issues. Uh, it's not just a question of data. Yeah, well, like, what were your thoughts on it? Because, like, for me, like, it was kind of hard to make out what was going on after some point. It just became very, uh, I, I think, like, very hostile. Model has bias. Let's see. So, we use the pen tree bank. Okay, sure. Wiki text. Okay, quantifying biases, okay, great. So this is what we're looking for. So for numeric data, bias can be caused simply by class imbalance, which is relatively easy to quantify and fix. So for text and image data, the complexity and the nature of data increases and it becomes difficult to quantify. So we can express the probability of a word occurring in a context with gendered words as follows. So the probability of a word given a gender is the count uh, of words of that gender divided by the total counts of all words with that gender divided by the count of, okay, yeah. So, so this was the formula we saw earlier, but GPT-3 might not be the issue, uh, might, might not be the main issue of the bias as it is large. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Like, I'm not sure I understand. So the bias score of a specific word is de then defined as the log of the probability of a word given it's female. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah, so, so this is pretty straightforward, I think. This, this makes sense. So the bias of a word is equal to the log of probability of word given that it's female divided probability of the word given that it's male. So this bias score is measured for each word in the text sample. A positive bias score implies that the word co-occurs more often and the words... Okay, so basically, and the... Like the goal is to make this uh, zero. A smaller context window has more focused information. A larger window size captures topicality. So we, uh, by choosing an optimal window of k equals 10, we give equal weight 5% to the 10 words before and 10 words after the target word. Okay, so to evaluate the biasing, we measure the bias for the generated corpus. To, to estimate the amplification or reduction of the bias, we fit the univariate linear regression model over bias scores over context words. Reducing B implies the biasing the model. Okay, so just to make sure I understand. So basically, you then take the sum of bias over all words and then goal is to uh, make this zero. So machine learning techniques that capture patterns in data to make coherent predictions can unintentionally capture even amplify the bias in data. So we consider a gender subspace in the learned embedding matrix in our model as introduced by Bulukovsky. We train these embeddings on the world level language and we conduct experiments for the three cases where we debias input embeddings, output embeddings, and both the embeddings simultaneously. So let S, let W be a word embedding corresponding to a word in the word embedding matrix W. Sure. Uh, and then let d i to d n be the defining sets that contain gender opposing words, man and woman. The defining sets are designed separately for each corpus, since certain words may not appear in another corpus. We consider a defining set if both gender opposing words occur in the training corpus. 
if ui and uv are the embeddings corresponding to the words man and woman then ui vi is equal to di okay yeah uh, this terminology is a bit too complicated like all this is trying to say is that like create pairs of uh, gendered words uh, as a way to debias the model so far uh, so we have this so the difference between the pairs of it, the, the pairs encodes the, the difference between the pairs encodes the gender information corresponding to the gender pair so we then perform a singular value decomposition on c okay obtaining this the gender subspace b is defined as the first k columns of the right singular matrix b so if i remember correctly the argument of why models might be biased is based on the transfer learning idea people tend to use vgg resonant and other pre-trained models on larger data sets like ms coco which people think they are generalized uh, I mean, yeah, like this was sort of a, like I think like a, a big chunk of the, da the data set that they used was like the, the Internet. And then I think Reddit was responsible for a big chunk of, of the training data. And so you can imagine if, if Reddit is biased, like, of course, the model is going to be biased. But the question is, like, let's say we know that, like, let's say reasonably that if we debias the data, then, you know, we could reasonably make the models better. But I'm also curious, is there any way like given racist data? can you still make a non-racist algorithm in some way? Uh, I think like it seems to be some, like the answer is like somewhat yes, like with, with these sort of like word embeddings, but uh, I mean, let's just keep reading. This I don't understand actually how this works yet. So maybe I'll read the original paper. Therefore to reduce the bias learned by the embedding, we can add the following bias regularization term to the training loss so the loss which is lambda nb and then take the Frobenius norm okay let's go up a bit nb what's nb oh so b is the first k columns of v okay sure so what's v then so Obtaining the gender subspace B is defined as the first K columns where K is chosen to capture 50% of the variation of the right singular matrix. Oh, interesting. Okay, no, so it's not quite this. So basically, uh, we take uh, gendered pairs and take the embedding difference between them in a matrix C. Then we take the singular value decomposition of this matrix and take the first K columns of the right hand matrix. which is called the gender subspace. Okay, how this, what, what does gender subspace mean though? It's a confusing term for me. Let's see. We notice increased mention of the less probable gender in this for, for fragile. The generated text that has reduced the mention of stereotype female words, but has no mention of female words. Similarly, in prisoner, prisoners, the generated text has no gender words. Okay, let's look at the analysis.
All right, so let's see. So in this paper, we quantify and reduce gender bias and world level language models by defining a gender subspace and penalizing the projection of the word embeddings onto that gender subspace. We devise a metric to measure gender bias in the training and generated corpus. And we study corpus level bias in two metrics, absolute mean and standard deviation. We additionally uh, observe a perplexity trade-off Oh, I see. So this is, and then the caveat of this work is this. Why did it copy it like this? Okay, so I think that the next thing we, we want to understand is this idea with uh, gender subspace, and what this means exactly. So I think this is the Bol Bobufaski, Bolufaski, where is it? Bolukbasi, okay. Bolukbasi. Oh, I th was this the first paper to introduce this problem? So man is to program, as woman is to homemaker, debiasing word embeddings. So this is something I should take a look at as well. So like, let's say the tool, what if Google? It's kind of cool, so let's do this. So basically, maybe in references, we'll put something like software. And then uh, Google what if tool. So download the pre-trained Keras model files. Sure, load the Keras models, define custom predictions, define helper functions for data set conversion, sure. Read the data set, invoke the data to note that the step may take a while. Do prediction speed of toxic demand. Tool height? What does that mean? Something else? So, although we might train the final model to a specific problem and we get the results that we wanted, the pre trained models still keep their biases within the final model. I mean, yes. So, so for me, like when I think of pre-trained models, I think of them as a, just a compressed data set, essentially. And so, yeah, if your compressed data set had bias, bias issues, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, your end-level model is also going to have them. Unless you do something else on top of that to de-bias the pre-trained model. But yeah, like it's, it's a question of the data. It's a question of the pre-trained model. It's a question of like the end-level model you're using. And probably more, so let's see. Performance of two models on the same data set. Okay, so we have some helper functions. Create and train the DNN classifier. So you have classifier two. Okay, how does this 
this work. Oh, it's literally, it's literally like just compare classifier one and classifier two. Uh, this is kind of cool. We didn't need block from your decide how to move bytes from your model in three lines of code. No, like that's that's not that's not something I'm doing. I think like like the issue with with this stuff is that unless I really know what I'm talking about, like it's best not to make strong <laughs> claims publicly. We'll see. I mean, but like this is part of it is that like I thought there are no tools, but then like when I see uh, this kind of stuff, it makes me a bit more optimistic. Cause like this is easy to use. Like I mean, so why not? Like if it's easy, people should use it. If it's very complicated, then you should expect less people to use it. All right. So let's get back to the Bulu, the Bulu paper. Bolukabasi. All right. Extreme she librarian socialite. Maestro. Philosopher. Like it may be like I mean at some point like if you want this problem to be solved it should like the thing we should strive towards is that you don't even know that you're explicitly working with bias you, you know you just do your regular ml stuff and it just works uh but i don't think that's going to be the case like i don't think the solution here is code it's actually like a combination of like governance and uh, like committees and debugging models so it's way messier, you know, like it, it's not like a, but, but part of it, like, and I talked about this earlier, is like there's always a straight off between privacy and, and bias. How about asking Alexa and she will solve it? I don't know. I, I, I'll bet to you that Alexa says racist stuff. Like, let's see, Alexa, uh, racist. Yeah, I agree. So it is important to quantify and understand bias in languages such as can reinforce the psychological status of different groups. Okay, bias within algorithms or bias within word embeddings. Sure, we saw this earlier. Analogies exhibiting stereotypes. Okay, so all of this is stuff we saw earlier. Soft bias correction. Oh yeah, so this this is uh, this is the subspace thing. So let's see. So first off, so this is the work. So this event is a remove certain distinctions that are valuable in certain applications. Yeah, so I also talked about this earlier. So, so some words are actually like meaningful. Like if you debias them, you're gonna change the, the the meaning of a sentence. Like if you replace grandma with grandpa, like those are not this. Those are not the same thing. Uh, so your model is gonna say weird stuff if you do this kind of stuff. So you may just like debias the stuff that is um, more important. Like let's say professions, for example. All right, and then so they identify the gender subspace. So, okay, so first off, let's see, the first time they say the word gender subspace is where? To learn a gender subspace, and our debiasing algorithm removes the bias only from the gender neutral words while respecting the definition of these gender specific words. So, man, the station. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I didn't think of man being a verb. Uh, 
Okay, wait. So there's a couple of stuff here. So grandfather and grandmother have different uh, meanings. Do you want to keep? I'm part of the Javis GL project. It's a fun experience to work on. A uh, cool project to learn more about Julio. What's Javis GL about? Oh, very cool. This looks pretty cool, actually. So you can do like this interact, like. I think what would be really nice, like as a proof of concept for the project, is like if you could make some sort of really simple math video explaining something with this, like it would make it very obvious. Because like I, I actually don't want to bother learning Manim, for example, for some of my videos. So if I can actually just use this, uh, I'd be very happy to do it. This is very cool though. Like a job. Like TB one B. Where's the tutorial? Oh, you're doing it. Do you, do you mind just dropping the link to the tutorial? Like, and does the tutorial, like, where is it? Oh, doc, okay. Yeah, make sure to put a link to it in the readme. It makes it a lot easier. Oh, I see, okay. There we are. Oh, nice. A video struct actions. Let's draw a circle. Oh, interesting. So, okay, so you're saying like I have a canvas and then I want it to start with a background and then I want to okay do this move oh interesting it's sort of like an animation system via text okay set hue interesting i mean these look really cool i'll be honest this is a dope project Rendering latte. Oh, I love it with the gradients and stuff. Very fancy. This is really good work, guys. Like, how long did this take you to, to build? <laughs> it's kind of cute. Started last month and I've joined two weeks ago. Oh wow, it's a lot of progress in just a month. Very cool. Oh, I've seen Ole on the stream as well. I think he was here last time when I was playing video games. All right, so let's see. To want to keep other times words like man is a verb this is my senpai oh i see very cool okay direct bias Okay, so okay, so so far we get this. Oh wait, let's 
it's called the identified gender subspace. It's a direction or a subspace of the embedding that captures the bias. So we neutralize or neutralize and equalize or so neutralize and equalize or soften. Oh, I see. Identify. Okay, wait. So we have this tenor parameters, then we let the bias subspace be the first k rows. Yeah, I don't get this whole first k rows thing. Like, so I'm just gonna add the note note to self. I don't get the first k rows. He always punishes me to be better. I mean, that's the best teachers, I think, are the ones that actually care about you getting better. Because like when people just tell you you're doing a good job, but you know you don't feel like it, it's very annoying. Carol's argument for gender subspace. Yeah. So can't do a hard uh, equalize. Need to uh, soften bias. Okay, oh, interesting. This was from Riot Games. Let's see. Let me do IUC. So the prediction of three human behavior, a lexical decision, word naming, and picture naming, through the lens of domain bias knowledge modeling, contrasting the predictive ability of statistics derived from six different corpora, we find intuitive results showing that British corpus overpredicts the speed with which an American will react to the words ward and dupe, and that the Google engrams overpredicts familiarity with technology terms. A British corpus overpredicts the speed right towards the word and dupe. Okay, so I think what this is saying is like let's see. So what this is saying is data set is highly There's all sorts of weird biases. And data sets. Just wanna make fun of my brother for burning his food. <laughs> what was he cooking? There's all sorts of weird biases in data sets, uh, not just uh, race and gender. Uh, for example, Google Ngram. Uh, predicts more familiarity with technology than other kinds of different food. <laughs> All right. So I think as far as some of the language model stuff goes, I think we have a pretty good story here. So let's look at some of the other stuff. So. I don't know if I want to watch a YouTube talk right now. Okay, so we did this. Let's look at the healthcare stuff. So a promise of ML in healthcare is the avoidance of biases in diagnosis and treatment. So a computer algorithm could objectively synthesize and interpret the data in the medical record. Integration of machine learning with clinical decision support tools such as computerized alerts or diagnostic support may offer physicians and others who provide healthcare targeted and timely information that can improve clinical decisions. So ML algorithms, however, may also be subject to biases. The biases include those related to missing data and patients not identified by algorithms, sample size, underestimation, and misclassi misclassification of measurement error. There is concern that biases and deficiencies in the data used by ML algorithms may contribute to socioeconomic disparities in healthcare. 
So this special communication outlines the potential biases that may be introduced into machine learning based clinical decision support tools that use electronic health record data and proposes potential solutions to the problems of over-reliance on automation, algorithms based on biased data, and algorithms do not provide information that is clinically meaningful. So, so far, none of this is different from the previous Booz Allen article that we saw. So let's see if this sort of differs in any meaningful way. Okay, so let's look at this table. So Ms. Klaff, so uh, correctly, inaccurately learns to treat patients of low economic or socioeconomic status to less than optimal care and according to implicit biases. Underestimation may lead to estimates of mean trends to avoid overfitting, uh, leading to uninformative predictions for subgroups of patients. So clinical decision support may be restricted only to the largest groups, spurring improvements in certain patient populations. Oh, I see. Okay. So let's go back here. And then we can do this. And then we'll click on this here. That's cool, though. Like, is, is your brother... Which, th this paper? Or in general, like all of this? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is just, I think, like, I wouldn't even call it science or pseudoscience. To me, it's just like, it's just identifying some issues. Uh, it's not clear. But I agree with you. I think part of the challenge with these topics is that more mathy people don't take it very seriously but people outside of these fields do take it very seriously and so i think it's worth at least part of this for me it's like i had been avoiding this uh just because like i i felt like the problem definition was a bit ambiguous and maybe not solvable uh but you know i'm optimistically waiting to be uh, to be wrong so people people ask me about this so i can't say that their concerns are not valid for special patient populations and make erroneous inferences about the case. Okay, so I think basically the some core issues around bias in healthcare. I mean, yeah, like I mean, uh yeah, no no comment on that. <laughs> maybe maybe in private we can talk about religion, but as you get older, you tend to not want to talk about religion with people anymore. Large portions of the population and result in accurate predictions. Okay, so some conditions uh, may only exist in, in some populations. Uh, predicting uh, mean values values around the mean will hurt small populations. And then three uh, certain features may. Uh, be uh, racist like socioeconomic okay sample size and underestimation yeah so this is all stuff we saw before so one thing i was curious about for example Yeah, so this is where this argument gets kind of tricky for me because on one hand, like in healthcare, you don't want race to be a big predictor of your health. But on the other, like, why is it that 80% of sickle cell anemic patients occur in Africa or India or Arabic? So there's something w weird going on here. Like this, this I'm not sure what to make of. Let me just add a note to this here. Uh, note to self. All right. So misclassification of the disease 
A clinical decision support tool based on such data may suggest administration of lipid lowering medications. Okay. So ensure interdisciplinary approach. I mean, let's look at this like proposed solutions. Identify Okay, so basically make sure there's a human in the middle. Ensure that key variables uh, take care in curating data sets and features. Three. Throughout data processing. I mean, yeah, like I don't agree with any of these solutions. Like it's kind of like, it depends, right? So if it's a diagnosis, you can have a human in the middle, but if it comes to something like analyzing a genome, like it's a bit harder since we can't read genomes. Uh, this is also interesting because sometimes you want to add it, sometimes you don't. It depends on the, on what you're trying to predict. Which means you're, if you already know the answer, then like, why are you testing it? Just give it everything. But then if you give it everything, it may be racist. So I don't know. Uh, feedback loops, sure. Yeah, so. I'm strict performance metrics. Yeah, so basically, so add uh, basically loss functions for bias. And make sure the trade off uh, is explicit. All right, so this is done. What other papers did we have? So we saw this. We These YouTube talks, I don't know if we'll watch them yet. We did all of this, right? So we did this. Let me see. Uh, yeah, so let's look at the reading list. I think this I'm curious about. And then we'll look at the FAIR ML book. So I had a friend recommend this book to me. Okay, a reading list, let's see. So, manufacturing the critical engineering manifesto, resisting reduction, the seven deadly sins of predicting the future with AI. Don't call AI magic. It's funny though, like, I really like Fair ML, I have skimmed it. Okay, great, so so I think like, let's, let's do that next. Cause so far, like, I'm not too optimistic about any of these titles, like, AI kind of a, algorithmic accountability. Seeing without knowing, okay, sure. Critical studies. Okay, I don't know what critical AI even means. AI transparency, explainability and bias, trouble with bias. I actually saw this talk back in the day. I was there alive. It was an interesting talk. Like I think she, she made a like she made the point very early on before people uh, really cared about this. She's a, she's a very charismatic speaker too, by the way. So I remember her uh, talking. For example, bigger input. So we've basically looked at all of the technical response. It's time. And the second, reflect to the social. Of course, four years ago, Facebook said there were only two men and women. So obviously something very interesting has happened in the last of the Nord, just Joyce pointed out. It's so no wonder that Dahlia is everywhere. 52. Created the building a high stakes. I mean, yeah, like, so, so some of this work, I think this is the main reason why people became interested in this topic. That's a good point. Like, I think I, I can definitely attribute that to myself, at least. Like, it was when I started paying attention. That's going to affect, really affect. We take, for example, this community being asked. Is there a summary the, slide? The, Okay, yeah, so let's let's do this then. 
The smile detection meme? I do not know what the smile detection meme. What's that about? Okay, so let's see. So I'll put uh, general uh, bias topics. Okay, Crawford talk. Uh, technical responses to bias. Accuracy, uh, blacklist, scrub to neutral, demographics, uh, equal representation, and then awareness. Let's see a smile detection. Is this not like, just share the link with me and I feel like an old man that I don't know a meme. Oh, I see. So there's basically, she's saying there's two forms of bias. What you call, I remember this, like allocation bias, which is like, let's say, uh, income easily quantifiable. And then a representation, which is uh, difficult to uh, character. Oh, yeah, of course. Like, like this was actually mentioned here. Uh, but this is like, I think, I think they're actually using it on Uyghurs as well. Uh, just like predicting whether you're going to commit a crime or not before you do it. I think it's similar to... Uh, I'm sorry. It's similar to this. This is a plot from this anime, actually. So it's like this uh, gun that you can point at criminals, but it only unlocks if they have, like, if they're actually, if, like, basically the, the gun predicts that they're going to be uh, a murderer. It's actually a pretty good anime. I watched this with my girlfriend. Like the main plot is that like this doesn't uh, work on this on the main bad guy. Whereas representation might be more than the distance between the genes. The universe find any. Well, I mean, let's take the CEO image search as an example. And she, Alex. Okay, so I think this is fine so far. So let's see, there are a couple of more talks I wanted to quickly take a look at. So there was, I mean, let's look at these two, right? So, and then after that, we'll go through Faramil. Wow, this is long. Okay, we may need to skip, uh, skip ahead. Okay, so so this was the Rachel promised her. Okay, wait, so Okay, so basically image classes calling bullshit case studies criminal machine learning. <laughs> what the fuck is this shit? So who's the criminal? So how are you, how, if you're not a criminal? I think, I don't know, it's like sharper edges or something in the face. Like what is it, what is this even detecting? Like, it's like not smiling as much. Like, 
I, I don't get this. I mean, I don't get why you'd even publish this at all for the want of a smile. So criminals have shortened distances between the inner corner of the eye, smaller is angles between the nose and the corners of the mouth, and higher curvature to the upper lip. Are you serious that there's a talk with these guys? Like, Please link, link, come on. <laughs> I have to see this shit. Should be put in question. Okay, so this is actually interesting work to mention. So, uh, so I think basically, let's see. So add this here. Studying, uh, analyzing uh, faces to predict if someone is going to be a criminal is dangerous. So, Yeah, I don't know what they were drinking either, but like my understanding is that like they would actually use this, right? Like what makes this work scary isn't that these like guys publish this work, is that if they publish this work, it means that there's overall interest in what, they, in what they're doing. Like, you know, it means like some people are using it in production. Like why would a security organization say that they're using this if they are? So this is where stuff gets really scary, I think. I don't think the, like the paper isn't the scary part of this for me. All right. First on people with dark skin. Let's see. Uh, algorithms uh, do better on uh, image recognition. Don't do well on uh, black people or women. Yeah, so basically also evaluation bias. So if SOTA algorithms are biased and measured, I, no, sorry, so SOTA algorithms won't deal well with these uh, bias issues. Did you see this recent work? Basically, there's like, let's say, predict using ML to predict the prison sentence. Using ML to predict uh, school grades or uh, job recruiting. Like racist or gendered ads and uh, newsfeed content. I have listened uh, to this week in ML AI. What, what, what are you talking about? Diagnosis, um, that's what we have measurements of. And 
there are a lot of factors that influence this, such as you can afford $700 higher and with fewer concessions. Responding to apartment rental ads on Craigslist with a black name elicited fewer responses than with a white name. White state legislators were less likely to respond to constituents with black names. Oh, they talked about this. A jury was 16 points more likely to convict a black defendant than a white one. But when a jury had even just one black member, the conviction rates were the same. So this is what I need to do to make so my podcast is, uh, look more serious. Really have someone's mug shot and then like a comment. I think like the standardization uh, helps to create a brand. So that's something I should be paying more attention to. Oh, I see. So even if bias exists in humans, ML bias is even uh, more harmful because it's more scalable. The dude has been doing this for over four years, I think, like three, four. Holy shit, three, five times a week. Does this guy have a job or is this his full time job? But yeah, I mean, it's totally doable, I think. Like, I mean, I would. It's sort of like I talk about this briefly, like, uh, but like this idea of being able to work in public is really powerful. Like you can, you know, just like look at it. It's like, let's say with Yannick, for example, like how many people just read papers obsessively all day. But like, you know, there's only one dude who summarizes them so quickly. Just encode it. Uh, feedback loops, which we talked about. Um, and so this is something I think we often kind of skip over in a project and kind of just start analyzing it without spending enough time on what is uh, that? What, what technology should we build and what should we not build. As an example, there have been at least two studies now of people trying to see if they can determine someone's sexuality from pictures of their face. And it's... Far bandish. Yeah, this looks cool. Like, I, I can't follow people that tweet this much, though. Let's expand my homepage. You know, very technology uh, like the kind of research. Um, uh, what should we. It only been looking at women versus diverse teams. And okay, yeah, so maybe the approach, I guess, like the checklist approach is, uh, is really what this is getting at can't really build uh, automated solution for this need to audit and basically accuracy of simple rule-based model this includes error rates for different uh, subgroups By the way, I, th by the way, I think about GPT-3 and the code project before the release because a GitHub lead engineer was a guest and she hinted about the project before release. Oh wow, really interesting. So look at you, like ML gossip. Is really uh, can the Yeah, so I think like what seems to me is that so recognize this will be an iterative process, consult with people often and audit often. All right, great. So this is good so far. So there was still the, the one more talk I wanted to quickly skim. 
trans and fairness and uh, ethics with this could be science degree all right so sorry like this is here i'll put this in the What's up with this pump it up music? Welcome to the Twinnel okay. AI podcast. Standing now that I, I Nurex has been transformed in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I, you know, because I the, my first time being here was 2015, and I really this was a conference I did not want to come back to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I had written about it actually. <laughs> I was to just pay in advance and then, uh, you know, get refunded, right? And so. We give out uh, per diem ca uh, cash for people to use for food purposes. So that's what, what ha was happening. Yeah. Um, uh, after the workshop, we were handing these visa cards, prepaid visa cards, um, uh, so that they can just use it for the rest of the week for their food expenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's a lot of advocacy that happens in Black AI too. You know, we once again had our visa issues, right. um, and then within Black, you know, that country ha was majority Black. You right. know, right. Um, and so that I love that interaction. Like, it's not just you know having a space for uh, the Black community to be here, but it's also like. Okay, I see. So then I will add this here. So I do remember this checklist. So, like, if you basically just say that okay well this is going to be an iterative process audit often uh, you know follow uh, this checklist for uh, reasonable advice with Abeba Burhani educating um, and what I'm personally like actually most excited about is the understanding that uh, this can't just be a technical fix. And that, uh, so for example, at AI Now, they had this uh, report discriminating systems, right? And for them, it's a system, right? So they're not looking at discrimination in uh, images, discrimination, they're looking at the system. And the system includes the people who are uh, a critical race theory uh, approach for fairness, right? Okay. So, so for example, the fact that so Joy and I were talking about how, in our, in our paper in Gender Shades, how um, race is a, a social construct, right? It's, it's, it's um, unstable across time and space, et cetera, et cetera. In this paper, they were, they were talking about how you have to really engage with critical race theory uh, methods and how you have to, you know, you ha race is again an uh, um, a social construct that sometimes maybe that's not what we want to use for annotating data sets. Um, same with the uh, gender, right? And but then there's a tension between, um, you know, if you're annotating. How do you put two x speed here? Uh, gender, right? You you need to make. This is the first time I, I use this site. Is there a Chrome extension user? Make sure something? that you're not further harming communities by even in, ch in cases where you have to define subgroups to see the model's performance um, on those subgroups, you have to, like, creating those subgroups is not a piece of cake, right? Like, and the complexities that arise when you define sub uh, subgroups, who's doing the defining, the taxonomy that you use? Situation of the nuances here? Is it um, kind of broadening of the folks that are in the field, or just I absolutely along, or? I think broadening of the folks that are in the field, nowhere, and how I guess I'll listen to this like maybe some other time, but like it would be they nicer are getting to published. They're getting tenure talking about black people and there's not a single black scholar there. Mm -hmm. I think that's exploitative. And then they would they would probably say, well, like we're looking for just this specific expertise and well, there's no black people with this specific expertise. But then part of your job, if you do really, really care about fairness, whether it's theory or whether it's something else, 
is to make sure there are people in that community. The model, a real Google model, it's not a toy one, right, that is being sold to people. You can see you have a model card for it, mm -hmm. right? And like how many stakeholders are there? Like what's the right granularity of, of, of documentation for whom and in what form? Okay, so, so what I are think you seeing happening on the commercial side of things, like I'm hearing more and more like for IBM, example, for example, yeah. has, you know, got Fairness 360. Yeah. And yeah. Making sure that I forget what the other, they've got a, a, several of these kind of ethics, yeah. fairness focused yeah. things. Yeah. There are startups, um, scholars, are, you know, Ooh. focusing on explainability, Maybe. which oh, kind of plays into this. Um, you know, how do you think about the sources of you know, the commercial space or even open source like the existing the scholars. set of activities going towards making this more tangible and accessible to practitioners yeah like i think you know um again like a lot of companies are coming out with toolkits and oh hey cedar prince uh yeah like uh like her student joy bolamini On my team, you yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> her, her glasses are dope. I like them. All right. Let's just keep listening to this. Let's come in quickly. We may need to just get back to this podcast since yeah. it's fairly long. Like, so the IBM one is a good one. Uh, Google, like, is integrating a lot of things into TensorFlow. Like, there's fairness indicators, for example. There's, um, there's also um, um, a lot of educational materials. Yeah, it's good to have you see the like Let me know if you have any questions really about anything. Like, like we're just so doing an overall on, um, overview of various all the biased you know, literature like, I can and, think of um, in ML. Other educational material that's out. So, like, for anybody who wants to kind of learn and uh, our company bias, right? Like, people trusting automated tools mm -hmm. uh, more and, like, more than, more than, you know, people or sometimes, right? And, like, people do work, work and trust. So, so, if I give you a bunch of tools and you do a bunch of tests, like, it shouldn't be like, okay, I did test why. Oh, interesting. Critical race methodology, gender shades, reductive seduction of other types. Okay, there's a lot of papers. Let's see. Okay, interesting. So, let's see. The below the biasing approaches uh, don't really work. Yeah, I was actually telling uh, Mazin this like, so for me, like I've been wanting to do more like interactive, like math animations, uh, but I don't really want to learn Manim because it feels to me like I have to learn this like new thing. It's a pain in the ass. Whereas, like, I'd rather have, but I looked at, like, the way you, you set things up. You're like, okay, here's a canvas, animate these objects on it. Um, I thought the way you thought of it was really nice. And I would say, like, even the, the tutorials I saw were very pretty. I think it would be really, really, really nice to have a video uh, of you showing how it works. Like, okay, well, here's, like, some animation or something. Like, so think of, like, just take a very simple three blue one brown like video but make it like 30 seconds long so it's not a huge pain in the ass for you to do it and then add a link to it in the readme i think it'll really make the case because it's not just a useful uh you know like, like i think this inter interactive animations are, are invaluable and it looks like you can export the gif which means i can add it to notebooks um so that sounds uh, great to me honestly like really really good job guys mazin also told me you guys just did it in a month which is nuts to me like so, wait, race and race category adopt an algorithmic fairness framework for socially constructed 
Conceptualization of race as a fixed attribute, treating race as an attribute rather than as a structural, sinusual, and relational phenomena can serve to minimize the structural as racial categories. I must sense. Yeah, I mean, this is this makes the problem harder and harder to me because, like, let's say even, like here. Let's see where was it. Here. This problem is uh, made even more challenging since uh, race isn't a static concept over time. I think so. At least that's what Ole wrote uh, on the doc when I got started. How did you guys meet Ole, by the way? He seems like an interesting guy. Gender shit, what is this? I'm Joy, and I research how computers detect, recognize, and classify people's faces. The system I was using worked well on my lighter skinned friend's face across different facial analysis. <laughs> the the other fuck? two? Well, they misgendered me. It of these that be gender classifiers, or just gender shades. I wanted to see how well different gender classification systems worked across different people's faces and if the results changed based on somebody's gender or their skin type and power. That so I could see how the system performed on lighter skin and darker skin. Then I chose three compasses to one of the largest data sets of Chinese faces. So now with the data set and the companies, I decided to run a test. The companies appear to have relatively high accuracy overall. Microsoft performed best, achieving 94% accuracy on the whole data set. All companies perform better on males than females. And all companies also perform better on lighter subjects than on darker Interesting. subjects. Yeah, so this is pervasive, it looks like. Data-centric technologies are vulnerable to bias and abuse. Yeah, so I'll do this. Like, these bias issues are prevalent uh, across companies, not just the single one. So if you're young, privileged, and interested in creating a life of meaning, of course you'd be attracted to solving problems that seem urgent and readily solvable. Okay, let's see. What do you guys think about nonprofits? Like, I think they feel like the scammiest thing in, in my mind. I feel it's mostly giving money to bureaucrats for the most part. And culture propaganda and patronizing is very saleable. Clinton Foundation. I hate like these virtue signaling people. It's like, like okay, sure. Like, what the fuck is this photo? <laughs> What's wrong with this dude? Okay, let's see. Let's look at this list again. So, okay, motivation, composition, collection process, reprocessing. 
Yeah, so, so I guess like this is like this is interesting because like this makes like Team Nut's argument a lot clearer on Twitter, and uh, that like when people say it's data set bias, like you should be specific. Like, is it the distribution? Is it the use? Like, the problem is is wider spread, and I kind of better understand her point. Okay, so let me write this down. Okay, so there's a model checklist. All right, so questions and overflow. Okay, yeah. So let's do this. So where was it? The model checklist. So uh, the the categories of things to look at are uh, one, the motivation. Uh, composition. The collection process. Reprocessing the uses, the distribution, and the maintenance. The categories of things to look at. Uh, yes, okay. So let's take a step back now, and we still had this guy. I want to check it. Uh, Twenty-one fairness definitions. Okay, great. Someone already created a summary for me. Okay, I'm gonna read the summary. I think like I, I may check out the, the rest of the talk later. Um, so this was this. So twenty one uh, definitions. Fairness. Okay. So statistical bias. Both have okay group fairness. If an instru instrument provides satisfies predictive parity, but the prevalence differs between groups, the instrument cannot achieve equal false positive and false negative rates across the groups. Different stakeholders in their view. How many defended society? Childakova. Recidivism prediction provide decision makers an assessment of the likelihood that the criminal will reoffend at a future point in time. So even though they're gaining a lot of popularity, uh, there's, discri there's discrimination. We demonstrate that the criteria cannot all be simultaneously uh, required across all groups. Cool. Too long. Yeah, I'm not sure because I know too long they don't read. I'm not sure what this means. Does he, does he say? Do they say? Takeaways connect trolley problems to theories. How does the purpose of bomb? But what problems should you most likely see us work on? What responses should we have? Should our institutions adapt to the rise of algorithmic consumer? Diversity representation. Oh, interesting. Yeah, this is a good summary, actually. Uh, 
it's so yeah so yeah so there are uh, this many definitions because okay okay and then think about take away think of the purpose of using some algorithm in production work with stakeholders to figure out what they uh, really want all right okay this was relatively straightforward okay let's see let's take a look at the Faramel book I did take a look at it like a while back let's see if anything changed okay so they have a class interesting I'm going to have to dip wanted to stay longer however I'll reach out to you later over discord yeah no problem let's see your prince it's nice to have you on Okay, so let's do this general bias topic. It's a lot of notes for that session. Uh, so let's do this and then write this. I'm just saying they're collaborating with Solon. All right. So let's see. I don't even know where to start here. There's so much stuff. A theory of justice, equality of opportunity, causality by Uta Pearl, elements of cause and inference. Free PDF available. Open access. Let's take a look. Yeah, this looks like it's like its own deep end. May need like a, another session because I'm realizing we already made the close to the two hour mark at this point. Raw data is the most important. It's not in textbooks. Measurement theory. Big data is disparate impact, it's not privacy and it's not fair. Theory of justice. And then possibility of fairness. Let's make it 24 hours just like the good old days. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean I'm I'm I may end up doing a longer session because like I think if I just log out now i may end up getting distracted with emails and not actually reading any of this so i'll just do it i may just take a bathroom break or something at some point our data is unfair
But I mean, like, this is the best I can do, right? Like, we're just gonna see how much we can cover. Like, I, I don't think it's gonna be reasonable for me to read all of this right now. So I will just, like, pick a few interesting stuff and then see how it goes from there. Actually, I may just take a bathroom break. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Okay, like, damn, I think we just went down a deep end right now. This, uh, this may take many more sessions because I think, like, bias we somewhat understood. Then fairness is a whole other uh, ball game. I think that we're entering in right now. Let's see. I mean, like, then there's these causality textbook. I'm not gonna read a 200 page textbook right now. You know, I'd be happy to, but I just want a good causality library. I feel with causality, it's like every time I get into this topic, like I just see loads of papers. Uh, but I just want like an example of how to use it, because counterfactuals I understand. Like that, it's very straightforward to get. It's powerful. It's easy to use. Uh, but everything else, I'm not too clear on how to use. I just know that the, the papers look complicated, and I spent a lot of time going through Pearl's book back in the day when I was a grad student. I didn't understand any of it. Okay, yeah, maybe some other, maybe some other time. So let me just add this to here. I'll say like topics covered include uh, causality let's go here sources of unfairness let's see statistical measures of despair Disparity. Criminal justice. Impossibility results. Okay, so causality, measurement sampling, uh, 
unsupervised learning, uh, legal privacy. Okay, I mean, let's let's do this one by one. Um, Okay, so this is an amazing blog if you've actually never checked it out. Andrew Gelman is, is just incredible. A lot of his blogs are just like these like tiny blogs and just like billions of comments. I think one of the best statisticians, maybe the best one to follow on Twitter. So, so statistics does not require randomness. The three essential elements of statistics are measurement, comparison, and variation. Randomness is one way to supply variation, and it's one way to model variation, but it's not necessary. Nor is it necessary to have true randomness in order to have a useful probability model. For my money, the number one neglected, neglected topic in statistics is measurement. So in most statistics X I've seen, there's a lot of on data analysis and some stuff on data collection, sampling, random assignments, but nothing at all on measurement, nothing on reliability and validity, but more than that, nothing on the concept of measurement, the idea of considering the connection between the data you gather and the underlying object of your study. It's funny, the data model, the likelihood, is central to the theory and practice of statistics, but the steps that are required to make this work, the steps of measurement and assessment, are hidden. So when it comes to the question of how to sample or how to randomize or the issues that arise that interfere with the model, statistics textbooks take the practical issues seriously. Even an intra-statistics book will discuss topics such as blinding experiments and self-selection. But bad things happen when we don't think about measurement. And what, then what happens? Bad, bad things. <clears throat> so we don't go to the trouble of measuring what students learn. Why? Because part of it is that measurement takes effort, and we have other demands on our time. We have vague ideas, nothing precise. Okay. Okay, it's not privacy and it's not fair. Does this mean like the font here looks really weird? It's breaking apart. Okay, it's better now. Okay, so I guess like this is sort of simple. Uh, privacy is not fairness. This is tutorial. So on the possibility of fairness, they use different notions of algorithmic fairness, and although these appear internally consistent, they all seem mutually incompatible. Uh, we present a mathematical setting in which the distinctions in previous papers can be made formal. In addition to characterizing the space of inputs, uh, to prove desirable properties, different mechanisms require different assumptions. Okay, uh, let's see. So many definitions of fairness are not uh, mutually compatible. Okay. Sample size. Even if we had a mythical source of bot and by training data. Oh, interesting. Okay. He's saying a couple of stuff here that I hadn't considered before, but let's just kind of go, go over them. So basically, 
even uh, with more data smaller groups will not get classifications that are as good as big groups there's less data Oh, yeah, I don't get this point. Attempted to classify usernames to white male. Okay, cultural differences. Okay, I see. Uh, rare features. Uh, features that are rare in large groups may not be rare in small groups. The additional resources for achieving fairness, but okay. Meaning 5% error. Oh, I see. 5% uh, error uh, on aggregate may be 50% error uh, on a small group. Okay. How much is this book? Seventy bucks. Yeah, no. Weapons of mass destruction. So the models today are opaque. They enforce discrimination. So this is weapons of math destruction. Okay. See, this ended up becoming sort of a rabbit hole. There's a lot more stuff here. I think I may need like another session just on fairness. Because this goes back more to like, uh, like, I don't know, political science theory and ethical theory and stuff, which is sort of its own thing. Uh, but it's not something that, like, should be unable to parse through, I guess. Okay, let's see. This isn't. This looks good. So let's do this. So approaching fairness. Uh, so blindness uh, doesn't work since other features uh, can leak stuff like uh, race. As demographic parity. So it requires that a decision such as accepting or denying application may be independent of the local. Uh, okay. So basically, demographic parity, uh, prediction, classification, 
should be independent of protected uh, feature. In the context of representation learning, it is attempting to ask that the learned representation has zero mutual information with the protected attribute. The notion is seriously flawed on two counts, so it doesn't ensure fairness. As long as the percentage of acceptance match, the classifier selects qualified applications in the demographic. Hotel chain that renders a promotion to a subset of wealthy whites who are likely to visit the hotel. The situation is obviously quite icky, but demographic parity is completely fine with it so long as the same fraction of people in each group see the promotion. Might have a much better understanding of who to target the majority group while essentially random guessing within the minority. So imagine we can actually see in the future, we had a perfect predictor of future events. So the predictor would uh, equal the target variable that you're trying to predict is probably one. Assuming for a moment that such a perfect predictor could exist, using C for targeted advertising could then hardly be considered discriminatory as it reflects actual purchase intent. The variable Y has some positive or negative correlation with membership. This isn't by itself a cause for concern, but in such studying, demographic parity would rule out the ideal predictor as a result. The, the loss in utility... I see, so... Uh, demographic uh, parity is fundamentally uh, not aligned uh, with accuracy. Like, for example, if I'm Lebanese, I'm more likely to enjoy hummus than the general population. Uh, yeah, so we need to look for the definitions. All right, I think this will be the last thing I take a look at because I'm getting sort of tired. So I'm just going to skim all the chapters that are available and then we can probably call it a day. Data to model. But the worry is that ideologically segregated populace may not be conducive to a function of democracy. Stereotype perpetuation. Okay. I see. Are you going to be streaming during weekdays? Uh, it depends. Like I think, th like weekends, I'm uh, committed to. Uh, this I thought like I was going to be doing this stuff for work anyway, uh, and I thought it could just be useful for uh, for more people. But yeah, I mean, if you, like I said, if you have any ideas for topics, let me know. Like, but weekdays, like I still have to actually, you know, show up to my job. So, <laughs> so it's like I wouldn't be able to do the stream unless I could align it with like something I had to do at work. When it comes to debating and defining fairness, okay. Okay. So.
no really my dude like it's it's no big deal like it makes me really happy to, to share anything so anytime okay so basically in the intro uh it's unlikely that we'll get a regulatory like a stamp of approval to say some algorithm is fair it's like diversity has different uh, definitions filter bubble I see, so there's a difference between fairness and selection and fairness and treatment. feedback loops GPT uh, yeah so feedback loops are important so let's say example like let's say most content uh, online becomes written by GPT uh, 3 like yeah good luck fixing bias then Okay, so far is so good. Uh, so classification, no fairness. So I just think criteria, calibration by group. Okay, so this was the intro. So I'll say this is intro, and then here. So uh, classification, impossibility results. So several classification criteria. Okay, this is uh, causality and counterfactuals. Counterfactuals, easy to understand. Rest of causality, to me, not so much. Oh, is this a quick? The system of sociological accounts. Traditional sociological and formal accounts of causality conceptualize causes as forces that govern fixed entities between three main strands of such forcing variable causality, treatment, manipulation, and mechanisms. Okay. Okay, and then let's see, so I 
like this. Remove examples uh, or features. Remove, uh, sorry, or change examples or features in the data set and see if the model output is significantly different. All right. Oh, I see. Like most uh, existing discrimination uh, audits are about uh, testing blindness. Uh, need to pay attention to our uh, color models. See if there's any sort of uh, unintended uh, spillover actions. Okay, I'm just going to read this thing and then I'm probably going to call it because this is getting kind of exhausting. So one of the most central tasks in NLP is language identification. So determining the language that a given text is written in. So it's a precursor to virtually any NLP task. So it's more or less a soft problem with relatively simple models based on n-grams of characters achieving high accuracies on standard benchmarks. However, a 2016 study showed that widely used tool LanguidePy, which incorporates a pre-trained model, has substantially more false negatives for tweets written in African-American English compared to those written in more common dialectical forms. The author's construction of AAE and white aligned corporate themselves involved machine learning as well as validation. The observed error rate disparity is likely a classic case of underrepresentation in the training data. 
Unlike the audit studies of car sales or labor market discuss, it's not necessary to control any features of the text, such as level of formality. While it may be uh, certainly possible to explain disparate error rates on such features, that is irrelevant to the question of interest, such as whether NLP tools will perform less. Uh, so NLP tools range in application from, in particular, NLP is used in predictive tools for screening resumes, so there are some potential discriminatory impact such tools. Oh, I see. So I think this is an interesting uh, case. I'll just copy paste this as is. Okay. So unlike the audit studies of car sales or labor markets discussed earlier, it's not necessary to control for any feature of the text. So we briefly survey other findings, potentially harmed. Okay, yeah, so this is, uh, this is particularly important. If an NLP model is deployed in the context of a news ranker, uh, job application uh, screening. Let's see. All right, Mazin. All right, everyone. Uh, I feel exhausted at this point. Like my voice is going away. So I'm gonna go cook some dinner. Regardless, I hope you learned something about like fairness and bias in ML. I think we have a good uh, reading list at the, and summary at this point. So if you have any questions, like feel free to email me or tweet me or whatever. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to check in my changes. Um, otherwise, I will see. Maybe we'll do some more things about fairness. We'll see. This is a big topic. I may need to just like read some more stuff offline, depending on what, what happens. Uh, but yeah, thanks again. Thank you, Mazin. See everyone soon.